So today's talk will be on pen testing Android applications. Uh, I have kind of uh, uh, have a lot of examples and stuff, and I'll start with the basics for keeping a, uh, the entire audience in the mind, so that you will learn the basics, and then you will know how to attack an Android application. And I will also give a disclaimer, but everyone will ignore after when the uh, POCs will start, because uh, we all are here to have fun and probably to earn something out of it. I'll, who am I? I'm Harsh Modi. I'm from Vancouver. So if anyone else is also from Vancouver, then you will always freak out with the gas prices here. So if you're Vancouver, you will understand the joke. If you're here, then it's OK. But <laughs> I, I was very excited when I saw the gas station for the first time when I landed in Alberta. And I worked at Fortune 500 companies like uh, Optive, PwC, and all those, and I've uh, worked with government and other clients to help them secure their web application and mobile application and all those kind of pen testing. And I have done all, I have also done IoT, network, and other things where I hacked a Bluetooth uh, pacemaker which controls the heart and all that stuff. So yes, I've been doing this uh, since I was, when I was in my ninth grade, I started this. At that time, I was not aware things like bug bounty exist. Otherwise, I would have made a lot of money because that was an era where everything was vulnerable and exploitable. So recently, I am uh, doing my own research on car hacking, which I will be presenting at B-Sides Calgary in November. Uh, I will see the community there as well. I also done research on ChatGPT because you know ChatGPT is the new, uh, new thing in this uh, modern world. And uh, we were able to do a lot of uh, things with that. And uh, Samsung Pay, because I'm, I'm Samsung Pay and blockchain and smart contracts are something I'm working on right now, because Web3 and blockchain are the future uh, of our industry, or probably they have started, uh, uh, you, being used by a lot of uh, people. I've also done some bounties and on Buck Crowd, Hacker One, and uh, with Cobalt. But when I came to Canada, I and so I, I, I never heard my American friend saying that we have tax, 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 and all those things. But when I came to Canada, I had to pay 40%. So I kind of uh, gave up the bounty thing because, <laughs> yes, yeah, so that's like whatever I've done. The agenda is uh, pretty much clear. I'll, I'll start with the basic question, what is pen testing? Because uh, my family members and relatives and some of my friends don't understand what is pen testing. They think I am testing pens. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I think offensive security is a term coined after when people don't realize what is pen testing. So then I'll have some prerequisites, what you should know, what you should know about Android and all those things. And there is a disclaimer that as in application development, Android and mobile application is for security. So you know how secure these apps would be. There is no S because no one laughed from the audience, so I'm making it clear. So then I have some POCs, and then I will share some of the resources that what you can do on your own. And then you can ask all the questions and you have. So the first question comes, what the heck is pen testing? Like, uh, anyone who is working here uh, before 2010 from the industry or like 2015 and stuff? So when I was like, when I started 2015, I started with uh, mobile app, uh, hacking Android applications and games just for fun. And then I was also selling those uh, games to my friends and other people. And I'm an entrepreneur, so. <laughs> yes, but uh, so it was very difficult to explain everyone what is pen testing and what we do. So I have kept this slide uh, to like, pen testing is finding security flaws for uh, anything that has an IP or anything which is electrical but you have to report it, document it, you have to take full uh, responsibility for what you do, and then you are also kind of uh, responsible for patching it or at least give an idea on how to patch it. And the most important question is legal, unless you want to come in, come in uh, like global news or CTV news. I'm not much aware of what are the news channels in Canada, but if you want to land up there, you can uh, ignore the fifth point. Also, one other uh, thing that a lot of people don't understand is that uh, scanning is scamming, which I tell. And I, I'm sure my friend Corey will agree with this. 
because he also had his in his uh, talk saying that i've seen a lot of people like just scanning with all those uh, 100000k or 100k uh, tools and which they are not able to find anything uh, it is same for the web uh, apis it is same for the mobile applications as well so uh, why mobile application pen testing so according to the statistics uh, there are like 5 billion plus applications or something like that on app store and play store so uh, and every company when you go on uh, like for example b sides edmonton and i don't want to take any names of any company or something because this is being recorded so uh, for example if you like everyone has their own application that goes into android and ios and all those stuff so we have seen a, a pretty high surge of uh, mobile applications and that's why and so that's the uh, difficult point here that we have seen a high surge in development but we have seen a low surge like a steep in the security side of it so security is less there are lots of misconfigurations there is a lot of sensitive information that is being leaked by that i mean that hard coded credentials and everything and i'll prove my point in the remaining slides so not to worry much uh, api leakage endpoint leakage so by endpoint i mean that uh, uh, how the mobile application interacts with uh, with the server or anything. Sometimes that information you cannot find it on uh, via the recon process or information gathering. That is a, a standard thing when you uh, perform a penetration test. But here you can find all kinds of endpoint and stuff. And because they are they are hidden, security is obviously less on these endpoints. We all know the popularity of Android and iOS, so that's like a, a huge market out there. Also, I have some G fees on the side. I hope no one gets offended or something like that. But uh, last time when I presented, there was someone from the government, and he was like, "Is it a joke to you?" And I said, "I I I didn't understand whether it was uh, the report or the G fee, but." <laughs> uh, so if you are a college student, then you will always get uh, something like this uh, uh, architecture. But I, I think it is better to understand what the architecture is, so you will know how to, if you find anything, you will know how to report things and in what layer you are. The first layer is the applications, and basically this is the most upper level where you install any application and a sandbox is assigned to that application so that the other applications cannot uh, see the data or those things. Those are the pretty standard stuff. Then there is application framework. Uh, there is activity manager and location manager, resource manager, which will give the allocated memory and all those stuff. Then comes library libraries. So libraries are something that will help the application to for a support. For example, if you want to uh, want to play a music file, then there will be a library supporting MP3. If you want to stream a video or something like that, so that would be uh, these libraries would support. Uh, there is also something called as uh, DVM and uh, all those things. So that is related to the when, when you write a Java code and it gets compiled, it's an assembly code, and then it is binary code. That's what when you get the APK. So those are those things, but will not go there. Hardware is uh, hardware layer is something that is uh, like the the buttons on your phone. So I have this pixel. So if you press this. And all those buttons, those are hardware layer. So they have a different code so that even if you, uh, sometimes even if the operating system is not there on the phone, but still you are able to interact with the with the buttons. So that's what the hardware layer is. So it is it's a different piece of code. It doesn't come into the, and kernel. So if you are exploiting anything in the kernel, then you will have uh, root access and stuff. So we'll talk about those in detail, I think. Yes. So now there are four types of app components. So if you have installed an app, then what after that? So when you open an application, uh, any screen that you see that is activities, like your login screen, you're sending some money, all those things, any individual screen are activities. Services, I'll go again back to the Windows background, anything that is uh, running in the background. So that are called services. Broadcast receivers, if you turn on your Wi-Fi, then a broadcast message is uh, is given to all the applications that Wi-Fi is turned on, so everyone will go WhatsApp, Facebook, everyone will give you notifications that this is you have what you have been missed. And content providers, like they supply data from one application to other on, on request. Uh, 
you have to understand one thing that the mobile phone that you have also stores data and it can also work as a server. So sometimes it will take data from the internal memory and then it will send it to the server. So that is like the client side mechanism and the server side mechanism. But a lot of people have this confusion because a lot of people come from the web application background. So like your browser is the phone and but mobile do store data in the internal storage in the Android data slash slash com dot the package and all those things. So please keep in mind that one thing. I've seen a lot of people with the mis uh, uh, like misinterpretation, so I've clarified it. This is what is in the application, that is the Android application. Uh, whether you download it from the Google Play Store or uh, pirated versions of the Google Play Store like uh, Black Market, APK, APK Pure, or anywhere you download and install. These are the Android manifest. Uh, Android manifest, so that there's, it's a funny thing in Android applications, so when they were developing, uh, they were like, okay, we will have this kind of index thing where we will give all out, all information out. So people like me will just go to Android manifest XML, pen test over, because everything is there in the Android Manifest XML. Name, version, permissions, components, everything. The meta.inf folder is, these are the files which is required for installation or execution. And the classes.dex, which we will uh, reverse it. But basically it has bytecode and applica Android applications are written in Java or Kotlin. The library folder is something that will have uh, native library specific to certain device architecture. So that would be like ARM device 32, 64, whatever you have, but it would have everything that would be compatible to your device so that you don't have to like on Samsung, on Google, on one uh, Google Pixel, OnePlus, you all only click the install button and it installs based on your resolution and everything. So here is it, I think those things comes from the library. Resources is very interesting thing because if, if application wants to uh, display a picture or want to play a sound or if any hard coded things is there like uh, AWS Firebase key or anything, then it goes into the resources in strings and .xml. Or, so everything in Android is stored in XML and there is also no S in XML, so there is also no security in XML. So, in resources.ac is this one uh, file where everything from the resources is uh, compiled in, in compiled version so that it, uh, the uh, application can understand it. It's in binary form. Now the prerequisites, like, these are not the complete list of prerequisites, but it will help you to get going. First of all, I, I recommend everyone who wants to pen test Android apps should have at least one uh, rooted phone. Why? Because he, there are a lot of uh, attack vectors where you want to see where the uh, application is storing something or all those things. I also recommend to have Android 8 or above because if you use Android 5 that was released in 2014-15, then there is no use of using such uh, Android operating system. I am a little bit lazy, so I in, I have Kali Linux because everything comes into it. But you can also have your own, uh, any version of Linux, like Ubuntu or anything. I think everything works fine because Le uh, Android is also Linux on the base. So Linux, Linux, you can destroy it better. So if you are Android Studio, if you have that much capability, then to run Android Studio, then you should run it. But I. I'm, I use Genymotion if I want to do any emulation or if I want to use any emulator. So Genymotion is uh, like uh, you select a mobile uh, phone that is Google Pixel 1 Plus. You select Android operating system from uh, gingerbread that is 2 point something to the latest 11 or 12, whatever it is, and then it will spun your shell. And Genymotion knows like this is people don't uh, use it for development, only they use it for testing. So I think it comes pre-rooted, so you don't have the, uh, you don't have the, uh, what do you say, like, you don't have to root it, like all things are there inside it. Now these are, these are some tools that I uh, like. One is Burp Suite, and everyone knows Burp Suite because like for dynamic testing, uh, whatever your application is sending, you intercept it, and then you can play with it, and you can uh, 
manipulate a lot of things. So Burp Suite comes from port speaker. And I will not go in much into Burp Suite because I think there are two or three conferences today where uh, Burp Suite was already being said. Drozer is something that is based on a client and a server model. So Drozer will be installed on this uh, your mobile phone. And there would be a server installed on your, uh, on your computer. And then you, from the server, you will interact with the mobile browser, and then you will poke applications. Thank you. And there is mobile security framework. So if you're really lazy, then you can just grab an application and put it into mobile security framework, because it does like 50, 60% of all the tasks, reverse engineering, or uh, Android manifest, or XML, and everything. So that is a good tool to look out. I started myself with mobile security framework, and then I saw where, what kind of things mobile security framework is doing, and then I started from their path. Actually, the lead developer of mobile security framework is also from Vancouver. His name is Eugene Abraham, and I had a pleasure to talk with him as well. Android Debug Bridge. We, Android Debug Bridge is a utility created by Android itself. We are misusing is it. That's a different thing. But so Android Debug Bridge is like you can install, you can connect with your phone. So here you can see that if uh, if you have connected something and you type the command adb device, then this is my uh, pixel, and this is how the pixel looks basically. So. If you have done all the things right, like installing Android, if you're installing Android Studio, then you will get ADB for free because it's a part of the Android Studio module. But you can also install Android Studio uh, alone. So I've done that. What, Android, what ADB does is that ADB interacts with the application, with the logs of the applic mobile application. And then you can also in interact with the application uh, and you can uh, put your files in there, install a binary if you have modi modified it on your, on your laptop using the reverse engineering and anything. So ADB is handful. ADB is like your C language. It has all the, all the functionalities, but you have to really look into all the methods. And uh, I highly recommend that uh, documentation by Google itself. Now the fun part is routing a, a mobile phone. Uh, does anyone uh, like have rooted their Android devices and void their warranty and stuff like that? Yes. I like the audience. <laughs> yes, yeah, so why do you want to root uh, your mobile phone? Uh, to buy some free games or something or? No, because when you, when, you, when you buy any Android device, the problem is that you don't have full access of that Android device. So you have to do kind of like, uh, you have to root the device and then you can look into the internal uh, memory system. You can modify a lot of things. Uh, I personally use Magisk Manager and, okay, I have to run fast. I personally use Magisk Manager and I install a lot of utilities because now Magisk Manager is the standard way to uh, root all the mobile, all, all Android system. Like, it doesn't matter whether you're Samsung or anything, you just grab the file and flash it and it will root it and you will have all the access to this slash system, slash bin, slash x bin. Modding applications, so I have done a lot of things, so I have a demo for you. And basically, I've chosen two apps that are not that famous here, but it works with most of the applications. So here, this is an application which is used for peer-to-peer. -peer. And now I will, uh, as you can see here, upgrade to add free option is there. So basically, you have to go and buy a key on the Play Store, and then there will be no advertisement. But I don't like to pay, so. This is the second application where you can see there is a remove ads feature. So now we will try to patch the application and so this is another application called Lucky Patcher. And I'm sure everyone would be aware of it because it's in the market since 2015. And these are the things that like, uh, I will choose the support patch and for in LV. So it will basically create a server here on the application and intercept the request. And then it will uh, 
return the request saying that the payment was successful. But it is not successful as we know because we have never went to the Google Play Store. So now you can see here that, oops. Now you can see here we have a professional version because we have patched the application and there is no like server side validation that whether you have really uh, bought it or not. This is another application and you can see that uh, ads are removed from here. Now I will ask a quick question to the audience that if you have this kind of, uh, if you have this kind of knowledge, which application will you try to get it for free? YouTube, okay. See, that's why we are different. Because I did it on Google Play Store itself. I said, why to buy, why to go and buy applications individually where you can do it, where you can do it. Uh, just patch the Google Play Store and get everything for free, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, yes, I was able to do it in 2015 and 16, and the problem was I was not aware of bug bounties at that time. Otherwise, I would have I got in it, a lot of bounties. But after patching the Google Play Store, uh, the, my first Gmail ID is blocked now. I've never, uh, <laughs> I, I don't have the access to one. But I remember that a lot of other applications were free for me. Uh, not all the applications from Google Play Store, but like, uh, and then there was like a Google constantly getting updated and all those things. But someone did this and Google patched it in like uh, six or eight hours. So. And yes, so that's why something, that's why it happened with Google. And I tried to find that video where some, where it was a video released by a researcher where you can just, he's just going on buying all those things, right? He's bought everything for $10,000. And like in five minutes, and any app that comes, he's just buying, 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 because he's not paying, so. And the other cool bug that, uh, that I found at that time, like, or I, saw at that time, but I did not have the resources to do it. The Pokemon Go, and even I saw someone here in the campus playing Pokemon Go, so uh, you can, we can share the IDs, you know? I still play Pokemon Go. So the, the problem here with Pokemon Go is when you reverse engineer, you will find some endpoints which spawn the Pokemons, so, and there is entire documentation given to it. So basically you can sit here at B-Sides Edmonton, and you can spawn all the Pokemons, because you have your own server locally hosted, and the first request goes there. So I, I think I completed the Johto League region doing that. But obviously now the security is much higher. I'm talking about 2016, 17 sometime when the app was recently released. And yes, so bypassing root detection. So how root detection works. And if you don't bypass the root detection, the most of the mobile banking apps don't work on your phone. But uh, the, the, I know the, how the developers uh, do this, so I'll teach you how to work how to work uh, banking apps on uh, <laughs> rooted device. So, so how the detection works is when you root a phone, these kind of things are available in the root directory slash su slash super su and all those things. These are the places where your this is basically the package that you install. If you install Magic Manager or any other routing device, then you will see uh, those. Uh, those directories. So change the directories, create a linked list or something like that, or you can use Magisk, Hide, and all those features, and most of the banking applications work. We are in Canada, we have, and it works in Canada as well. Because we are being recorded, I will not say the banks, but it works on all the banks. Enjoy. So this is like the systemless host and the Magisk Hide config. So I think we are late on time, so I'll SSL pinning, so what is SSL pinning? So SSL pinning is a feature that you cannot intercept the, the request from a mobile to a burp suit or something in between. But they have not met a hacker, so I'll teach you how to do that. Usually if you have a rooted phone and you import the burp suit certificate on the root directories, then most of the applications will work. But considering that we are, uh, we are taking a very, a secure application, which I have not found yet, but you can do with uh, <laughs> you can do with Frida and other tampering tools, where uh, create your own server on the application uh, in in a rooted device, and then these are the commands. There are lots of commands actually to start a server, to spawn a server, to uh, grab the Frida binary, and all those stuff. 
but I would recommend to look into the uh, documentation of Frida itself. Anything that you want to learn, always go and look at the documentation first rather than going on some blogs because documentation is uh, made for the most latest and recent version, whereas blogs can be depending on how old they are. And see, this is like a very famous application. I would not name it, but the SSL pinning has been bypassed. And now I can use uh, Verb Suit or any other thing to uh, uh, catch the traffic. Reverse engineering. And how many of you have done any kind of reverse engineering from the audience? Like, yes, you are a CTF player, so you would have done it. And so basically reverse engineering is something that you have the binary, but you don't have the source code. And you obtain the source code and then look into the source code and poke it into the source code just to see how, how things are working. So Android application, there are two or three ways to reverse engineer. But I prefer the APK tool because it's very easy. So you can use APK tool, you can decrypt and view the source code. Also, the second thing is you can <laughs> rename the APK to zip and you can extract it if you just want to use the bare minimum tools uh, Linux, uh, every Linux operating system have. And then the uh, Java or any kind of source code that is available can be used in any Java interpreters or Java code viewer, that is JADX, JDG UI, and all those stuff. Why do you want to read the source code? Because there are keys strings, APIs, and all those uh, juicy stuff. And also when you, so you have to understand this functionality that whenever you are logging in, the, the dev developers kind of record something in the log of the device, and logs of the devices are, uh, are accessible by every other application in the, in the mobile application. So here there is an application where if you, if you log in, then the access token is uh, shared to the log cat. And so any application can grab it. And the developer was under the influence that I have the best application. So the uh, session code token was not even expiring. So you know how things can go. You can also uh, automate these things. So you can use uh, Linux utilities like grab and unique sort and all those things. And you can find all the XML and you can look for terms like password, tokens, APIs, and keys, and uh, you can just poke it around with it. Usually there are two files, Android manifest.xml and strings.xml, where you can see these things, but usually developer leave, uh, developers leave everything, anything, anywhere, so uh, yes, it is good to know all those things. This is something that I've, like, I've, I have to explain you what is OAuth. So OAuth is something that log in like Google or log in with Twitter or all those things. A, a unique token is generated that is like a, your username and password is not shared or a token is generated and this token is then shared it with those services for like. This is a functionality which is not logging into Google or Twitter, but this is just a functionality where you share your video on Twitter or Google. So you will get a link and you can post that link onto the Google or, uh, sorry, Twitter or Facebook or stuff. But I think the developer copy pasted the code from somewhere which had the authentic OAuth uh, kind of request. So the token is also shared in the request and response. So I had to hide it because, you know, someone would call me tomorrow. So, so those are the, like this is burp suit and I, I intercept the request and first I missed it because I was not expecting it to be there and then I found it and we had a big conversation after that. So another feature of uh, Android is web view. So what is web view is that basically you can have anything from the website displayed directly into your Android application. So. You will have all the OWASP top 10 for web application available for in mobile application also because there is a web view kind of feature. Here we have gained an RCE on this application. And what we have done is that we have, uh, we have uploaded this shared object. We have uploaded this shared object and it has just a simple uh, command that sends a request to us in our, in our local environment, but we can do it on the internet as well, uh, but 
I prefer to do it local because the phone is with you. But using uh, tools like NG Rock and all those things, you can send your shell. And the thing is that you've sh this is an application where you upload a file and then you can share it with anyone via message. So for example, if I upload this file and I share it to anyone, and then they open it, then I will get the uh, shell for it. Why? Because this is the graph libgraphic.shared object. What does it does? It that like GIF and all those kind of extensions, uh, this application renders it via this uh, graphic library. But as you can see, it is dot dot slash dot dot slash dot dot. If I upload it like this, it will go to the root directory of the application and replace this file because the application have the permission to do that even on a non-rooted device. So it will replace it and once you open it, or once you open it, then it will give me a shell. So here we have, oh. So as you can see here we have the shell and I just did LS and I have a lot of uh, information from that mobile phone, but we can access all kinds of data here because uh, the application has the permission to uh, check the file storage, uh, photos and everything, because usually we don't see what kind of permissions the application is asking, and we just allow, 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 and we just press allow as fast as we can. <laughs> so. How Android should ask for permissions, there is a debate still going on. And I, in my experience, a lot of applications ask for a lot of, uh, lot of permissions which they do not require. Or maybe they require in future or something, but uh, permissions are always misplaced. Uh, Drozer. So we have this, uh, Drozer is again client-server model where you install the application on the on the mobile on, the, on, on your mobile, and then you interact with the server. Drozer is same as Metasploit, because it has, and I absolutely l like the person who invented Drozer, why? Because he was very, like, he was very fun of English language. So you can see the commands, run app.package.list. So you know that it will list all the applications on the phone, and then you, there is that dot attack surface, so it will see that how my, the broadcast receivers, the content providers, whatever is exported and all those stuff. If you have installed Drozer, this is something that it will look like in a, in a Ubuntu Linux. So I'm covering all the Linux operating systems, Kali, Ubuntu. So this is, this is an application where I have, uh, the application was storing everything in the, in the, in the root, like slash var slash lib, which is kind of that that ma that space is only allocated to that application. And if you navigate, you cannot navigate to that application, uh, to that folder if you don't have a rooted device. But you don't need a rooted device because from browser you can find out that there is a, a content provider which exports all the databases. And on those in those database sorry in those databases we have passwords, keys, pins, and everything stored in there. And I think the developer was not aware that, uh, he was under the impression that every, no one can see here, so everything was in plain text. But to convince him, we had to uh, do a SQL injection. So imagine you already know what's in the database, but still you have to do an SQL injection because the developer doesn't understand what you are saying. But I love developers, why? Because I'm getting paid for their mistakes, so I don't complain. <laughs> but uh, this is the thing. So, yeah, so this is the same vulnerability. I'm showing it via SQL injection on the local device. And yes, so this was the GP where he got offended. So. <laughs> deep link exploitation. So what are deep links? So deep links is another uh, Android feature where you can uh, access uh, something if if it has a unique URI or unique protocol like HTTP, FTP, STP, and all those things, then you can define it as a deep link in intents or and those kind of things, and then the application will basically go and authenticate, and then it will come back. The problem here is if it is misconfigured, then you can authenticate it somewhere else as well. So, for example, the URL is HTTP slash slash ABC dot com or anything. But the application is not checking whether this is the URL I should go to or not go to. So basically it's like 
uh, if I'm from uh, abc.com, this kind of request should only go to abc.com. But here it is not kind of going that. Here the, somehow the local host of a, of a machine is, uh, is in the whitelist section. So I just uh, spawn it. And where it is written URI schema, you can uh, have that uh, deep link. And you can get the uh, you can get the OAuth token, which is obviously the OAuth token is also shared across a web application, mobile application, and stuff. So you can do it. I am also a big fan big fan of Zlatan Ibrahimovic, so I have kept it there. Final thoughts. So on one side you have all the vulnerable applications. That is uh, Android Goat MSTG is from uh, OWASP itself. Diva is by Payatu. So Payatu is a company in India, but I read one of the first blogs of Payatu, so that's why I like know Payatu. Then there is Injured Android, and so basically, if, if you want to learn, you can grab these applications and break them. And, if, and once you have mastered your skills, you can go on to Play Store and also grab and break everything if you want, because unless you don't tell anyone what you have done, you are not guilty. <laughs> Uh, advanced research topics for this uh, is obfuscation, deobfuscation. So some companies have started to encrypt their binaries. Some companies, I mean, one percent. So, <laughs> so actually, they will uh, have the entire thing encrypted. But there are also deobfuscation techniques. So you weren't able to see the source code. It would be like A A B B C C A A C and all those things. When you open the file in uh, JD GUI. Deep link exploitation and Frida exploitation and all those things are, are vast topics. So I've kept it here for anyone who is interested in this. Bypassing biometrics. So since we have a, a couple of minutes, I will go into bypassing biometrics. Because now a lot of things you, uh, when you once log in, the next time on mobile applications and every other applications is, you can log in via your face ID or your thumbprint and everything. So if you're on a rooted device, then you can actually break into those things. So there is a huge research going on those stuff. And reverse engineering is also something that I've just touched it. So there are, there are lots of techniques for reversing and uh, patching and modding an application. So I've kept it here. Thank you very much. And I... I also thank uh, all the organizers, organization, or organizers, uh, sponsors, volunteers, and my man Harvinder, who is the man of the match <laughs> of B-Sides Edmonton. So thank you. If you have any questions. If you have any questions, you can sh shoot at me. Just the questions, though. <laughs> or I you can ask. Here, quick question on uh, the concept of uh, containerization for okay, okay. mobile devices security. Sorry? Can you Con containerization? Yeah. So can you comment on that, and uh, is it really a good control to protect uh, mobile applications? Because I see it being implemented, uh, especially for bio bring your own devices to separate between corporate applications and personal applications. Does containerization help based on what you just presented? I, I have myself escaped from a lot of containers and sandbox environments. So it is really how you have configured those things. It is same as cloud, like by default cloud is a little bit secure, but all the misconfigurations and those things happen. Because of that, a person is able to break out of it. By default, also Android gives a container and sandbox env environment. So for example, one application cannot access other application, though they are at the same level of uh, authorization, like at the same level in the architecture. All the applications are at the application level. And then they ask for resources and stuff. Yes. So. You mentioned about uh, SSL certificate and you know breaking SSL certificate. Is there what from your uh, point of view? Is there a solution that would be foolproof? Um, and no, no. Why? Because see, the problem with uh, SSL certificate and pinning is that you have the entire mobile in your hand, right? So. Sometimes you can even get the certificate that is uh, like 
which is being used, if it is not properly encrypted and all those stuff, you can modify it, you can go through it. If you have an Android, or if you have a rooted device, then, this, then the whole game changes. The other thing, uh, other technique that has happened in the recent industry is that they have tried to like maximize the encryption level to a certain, but when it comes to mobile resources, I think going at that kind of level of encryption, most of the mobile phones will not support because we have like 4 GB, 6 GB, and uh, Android is same as Windows. Everyone is grabbing memory, so I think that's a bit concern. Uh, my question for you, Modi, is um, I'm just over here. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's Michelle. Yeah. Um, question for you. Uh, I, I was very intrigued by the OAuth tokens being exposed by the applications. In your research, how many applications are not handling the tokens properly? Because that's clearly not handling the tokens properly, right? I'm counting, actually, but <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a decent amount of uh, applications that does that. Because here, the request was not to, sh not to th the token was never asked here. Still, the developer was uh, giving out and sharing it. And the funny thing was that also the, if you exactly copy paste this token and just go into your developer tools, then you can be the same user. So that's the thing on that. And you are on Twitter for that user because it's OAuth, right? So that's the thing here, yes. But see, the problem with mobile application development is a part of the DevSecOps where everything is agile, means they want everything very fast. And when you do everything very fast, it is a bit insecure. Thank you.